Thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video. It's well known that the Romans equated their king of the gods, Jupiter, with the Greek king of the gods, Zeus. But it wasn't until my college Greek class that I learned that these two gods are not just related mythologically, but also linguistically. How does that work? Because Zeus and Jupiter sound very different. Let's take Jupiter first. In Latin, his name would have been pronounced something like Jupiter. This itself could be broken down into its proto-Italic roots, dius and pater. Dius roughly meaning day or sky, and pater meaning father, which itself derives from an even more ancient root, dios pater, or sky father. And here's where we start seeing the similarities to Zeus. The ancient Greek letter zeta is not a 100% equivalent to the English z. It probably had a bit of a D sound to it. So from Dios, we eventually get Zeus. And in fact, we sometimes see Zeus rendered as Zeopater in Greek literature. But Zeus and Jupiter are not the only ones to share this linguistic connection. Consider Dioshpater, the sky deity from the ancient Sanskrit text, the Rig Veda, one of the Hindu sacred texts. Wait a minute, Sanskrit? Ancient Vedic text? Now, it makes sense that ancient Latin and Greek might share some similar words because of their close geographic proximity and overlapping histories. But an ancient Vedic god shares the same name too? What's going on here? How could this one name sound so similar across so many different cultures separated by thousands of miles and thousands of years? Throughout the 1700s and 1800s, linguists started to notice these similarities across different languages spanning a huge swath of cultures and regions. So many languages seem to be related. And not just similar vocabularies, but even similar grammar and syntax. Scholars dubbed this web of related languages the Indo-European language family which is, in fact, the largest language family in the family of language families, with 46% of humanity speaking an Indo-European language. But historical linguists didn't stop there. If all these Indo-European languages branched out across the world, can we follow those branches back to the original trunk of the tree and reconstruct an ancestral root language underneath it all? And if we can reconstruct that prehistoric language, can we reconstruct their religion too? Historical linguists have attempted to reconstruct what's called the Proto-Indo-European language, or PIE, a theoretical ancestor of all the modern Indo-European languages. The tricky thing is, this is a completely prehistoric language. No direct written evidence for it exists. Our oldest archaeological evidence for Indo-European languages shows that the family tree had already branched out over thousands and thousands of kilometers by the Bronze Age. Evidence for this comes from languages like Vedic Sanskrit, the Hittite language in Anatolia, and the old Iranian language of Estin. So Proto-Indo-European would have likely been spoken sometime before 2000 BCE. But in order to reconstruct it, we need to peer into the past beyond our ancient textual sources. Historical linguists do this through a completely inductive process. They infer conclusions by comparing words in different Indo-European languages and tracing backward to a hypothetical ancestral word. They can do this because the sounds of human language tend to develop in predictable ways over the course of centuries. For example, it's very normal for a P sound to eventually turn into an F sound in languages all over the world. This is why the Latin word pater and the English word father can both stem from the same Proto-Indo-European root. The word just took a different path in Proto-Germanic as the P sound slowly morphed into an F sound. So by following the regularities of sound changes, words in Indo-European languages are compared sound by sound, going through each sound in each word in each branch to see if they can converge on one unique sequence of sounds that could have evolved into all of them by known rules. By using this method, historical linguists have constructed hundreds of Proto-Indo-European words. Words like duo for the number two, meter for mother, and podes for foot. As the argument goes, the fact that the word for the number two begins with a D sound in so many languages, from Hindi to Spanish, must mean that these languages retained the sound of some ancestral word for the number two that also began with a D thousands of years ago. Now, it's very fair to ask, how real are these reconstructed words, since we have no hard evidence for them? Well, linguists continue to debate that very question. And in fact, that asterisk before these Proto-Indo-European words is meant to alert readers that these words do 
not appear in natural language. They are reconstructions. Many argue that we're recreating a vague approximation at best. The scholars of Indo-European studies, J.P. Mallory and D.Q. Adams, make the very good point that whatever this language sounded like, it undoubtedly had dialects, like any language. And yet we only create this one ancestral language. But a vague approximation is still an approximation. Mallory and Adams argue that if you traveled back in time to 3300 BCE, armed with a reconstructed Proto-Indo-European lexicon, you'd probably find moments of understanding with these Neolithic speakers. Moreover, archaeologists have also discovered ancient Hittite and Mycenaean Greek inscriptions with sounds that historical linguists had already predicted should exist. So this comparative method has been proven to work with real-world archaeological evidence. You might also be asking, well, why stop at Proto-Indo-European? It's not like this hypothetical ancestral language popped into existence from nothing. It undoubtedly had ancestors too. Why not go back even more to pre-Proto-Indo-European, or Proto-Pre-Proto-Indo-European, or the origins of human speech itself? Well, historical linguists have tried to do that, but they generally stop at Proto-Indo-European because that's the farthest back most think the comparative method can carry us with a reasonable degree of certainty. But can we dig deeper than the Proto-Indo-European lexicon? If we can reconstruct the form and meaning of certain words over the course of thousands of years, then perhaps we can also reconstruct the society, economy, and environment implied by those words. For example, the fact that words like sheep, wool, and weaving existed in Proto-Indo-European means that we can reasonably reconstruct an economy that involves shepherds and weavers. So can we reconstruct their religion as well, based on words alone? Reconstruct the beliefs, rituals, and myths attached to their religious words? Let's return to the concept of God. Historical linguists argue that the Proto-Indo-European word for God sounded something like dewos. This is reconstructed by comparing words in later Indo-European languages. In Latin, we have the word deus. In Sanskrit, deva. In Lithuanian, dievas. And deva in Avestan. Words that all refer to some sort of superhuman entity or being. This hypothetical ancestral word dewos seems to derive from a root word for daylit sky. Dieu, from which we get the name Zeus, and Dei, meaning brightness in general. Thus, scholars theorize that the word Dewos was not just a generic term for any god, but specifically celestial gods or sky gods, as opposed to underworld gods or intermediary beings like demons or ghosts. There's even a possibility that they worshipped a sky father that also functioned as their most supreme god, like how Zeus and Jupiter functioned in Greek and Roman religion. This is based on the theory that the words for sky father, dios pater, must have appeared together as an epithet, a descriptive phrase used especially in poetry or song to describe the quality of a particular person or god. The characters in Homer's Iliad frequently are paired with epithets. Laughter-loving Aphrodite, far-shooting Apollo, slayer of men Ares, and when it comes to Zeus, he's called father in Homeric literature. The fact that these two words appear together as an epithet in different Indo-European languages, including Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, makes it possible that the phrase itself may derive from Proto-Indo-European, a skyfather named Dios Pater, or simply Dios. Whether or not this skyfather was the supreme god, though, is up for debate. The philologist Martin West points out that the skyfather in the Rig Veda is actually a very minor deity. Of the over 1,000 hymns in the Rig Veda, none are addressed only to him. So while it's possible that the Proto-Indo-European Dios Pater was some supreme sovereign like Zeus, there's also a possibility he was simply the personified sky, and some other god outshone him. And historical linguists have reconstructed a few other potential PIE gods. There's a possible Earth Mother Goddess who may have been a consort to the Sky Father. There was also a Dawn Goddess with the epithet Sky Daughter, an epithet that appears both in Sanskrit and Greek. Scholars identify this Sky Daughter as one in the same as a Dawn Goddess named Husos, pointing to several Indo-European traditions that deify the Dawn using a similar name. But there's not much else we can say about the Proto-Indo-European pantheon. 
some scholars of comparative mythology have argued for elaborate recreations of Proto-Indo-European mythology based on identifying myths shared among different Indo-European cultures, but nothing is definitive. Anything more we can say about these hypothetical gods has been lost to history, and no archaeological evidence for their worship remains. Looking at the rest of the Proto-Indo-European lexicon, we can reconstruct other aspects of their religious beliefs and practices. They must have sacrificed animals, based on the reconstructed words meaning sacrifice and sacrifice official remains. The root sec has been theorized to refer to something that is worthy to be sacrificed, a root that eventually developed into the Latin word sacer, where we get the English word sacred. Scholars have also reconstructed words for prayers, oaths, and libations as well. So who are these people who spoke this Proto-Indo-European language? the people who presumably also worshipped a dios pater. Scholars have put forth a few candidates for the Proto-Indo-European homeland, but it's important to stress that there is no certain solution. Mallory and Adams warn us that the homeland is an interesting question, but it's so difficult to resolve and requires the application of so many less than robust means of argument that most archaeologists and historical linguists do not find it a worthwhile enterprise at least for themselves. So keep in mind we're swimming into fairly speculative waters. To locate the Proto-Indo-European homeland, we can start with a bit of common sense to come up with chronological parameters. First, these people must predate the second millennium BCE, because already by then we have archaeological evidence of Indo-European languages being spoken in Anatolia, Iran, Greece, and India. The civilization must also date after roughly 5000 BCE, because the shared vocabulary reflects the reality of a late Neolithic economy and technological progress. There are shared Indo-European words for domesticated animals, domesticated plants, as well as pottery, plows, and wheeled vehicles like wagons. While some scholars have argued that the language family must have emerged during the late Neolithic or early Bronze Age from Anatolia, the most popular theory now argues that the Indo-European homeland was the so-called Pontic Caspian Steppe, the grassy plains that stretch from the northern shores of the Black Sea to the area north of the Caspian Sea, largely in what's now Ukraine and southern Russia. Anthropologists hypothesize that these Proto-Indo-European speakers are the same as the Yamnaya culture, the name archaeologists give to the people living in this region roughly from 3300 to 2600 BCE. These were pastoralist nomads, herding their flocks, perhaps aided by horseback riding and wagons. In fact, archaeologists have discovered about 250 wagons and carts and burial mounds in this region that date roughly to the Yamnaya period. These two developments, horses and wagons, must have played a central role in their economy, and was possibly central to the successful spread of their language as well. Horses allowed for a more mobile form of herding, driving your cattle and sheep over long distances, while wagons allowed for bulk transport, basically mobile homes you could use to carry your tent and supplies, which enabled clans to range farther from home than their ancestors could ever dream of. In fact, the anthropologist David Anthony thinks that they lived out of their wagons, based on the fact that we find a lot of evidence for wagons and burials, but no evidence for long-term settlements. As the theory goes, this new way of life enabled their language to spread outward into the rest of Eurasia, sometime after 3300 BCE, perhaps in several waves of migration. Maybe it's not a coincidence, then, that generations of nomads would come to worship a sky father. Looking out across the flat Pontic Caspian plains, there's not much else to look at but grass and sky. But this mysterious sky father is known only by his name. A name, though, that lived on for thousands of years to come. Thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video. Wondrium is an online learning platform featuring educational documentaries, lecture series, tutorials, and more. In today's video, we went in-depth about the Indo-European language family. And if you want to learn more about similar topics, Wondrium has lots of options. Just typing in linguistics in the search bar reveals a series on the history of the English language, a series on language and the mind, and one on the origins of human speech itself, each one taught by top professors at top universities. Wondrium is always adding new content, too. Today I want to highlight their new series, The Real Ancient Egypt, taught by four different Egyptologists. I spent the last two years in Egypt as a postdoctoral research fellow. Ancient Egypt has been one of my long-standing fascinations, and I'm always excited to see new quality educational resources for this topic, especially when taught by actual scholars. 
The series is nine episodes long and covers ancient Egyptian gods, their beliefs in malevolent spirits, and their beliefs and practices around death and the afterlife. The last episode is called How to Rob a Pyramid. It's an absolutely fascinating dive into the world of tomb robbery. If you'd like to watch this new series and more, OneDream is offering the RFB audience a free trial. Head on over to OneDream.com slash religion for breakfast to get started, or click the link in the comments below. Thanks everyone.